format then was what, it was elevator music, beautiful music. And uh, the one guy who really has to be mentioned is JT Coppolis, because JT was on the original staff with me. And him and I would hang out, smoke cigarettes, and make fun of the, the music that we had to play. And um, he would do a show from seven to midnight, a big band show. And he was supposed to play uh, uh, Jersey Bounce from the Dorsey band. And I said, play rock and roll from Led Zeppelin and see what happens. And he just looked at me and goes, okay. And he went and did it and the phones lit up. FM 106.3, that's all you had to say. He says, hey Matt, I, I, there's a radio station you should be on. I'm like, really? What is this station? This is nuts. Oh my God, did you hear this yet? No, you gotta hear this. All of this really exciting alternative music was coming on the scene and it needed a place to be played. There was nothing that they played that I didn't like. Breaking acts from all over the world. The Smiths. The Replacements. Minutemen. Echo and the Bunnymen. 10,000 Maniacs. Dramarama. Who else played Depeche Mode? But we were always looking for the next big thing. We liked that we got a lot of oddball stuff because we played a lot of oddball stuff. The bigger radio stations weren't playing this. Anything you could imagine playing, you could play. Mike Marone played music for me and my life was never the same. You could call the station and they'd play your song. We were truly underground. It was a, definitely a word of mouth proposition. Dude, what is, what is this place? In a house. It was just this little house. You walked in and go, you mean you broadcast out of that? It looked like a, uh, a ranch house, as I remember, or, or part of a trailer park. As primitive as you can imagine a radio station being, WHTG was that. The equipment was dreadful. I'm literally rigged up with tape. She lived in the house we were working in. It wasn't enough room to sit in there. And the cat jumped up on the turntable while the record was playing. It's almost like you served in battle together because she did. Like being a part of a, the coolest family ever. We understood each other. We knew how to press each other's buttons. You know, we weren't your normal radio people. But make no mistake, this was the cool underground thing going on. They were creating the sound of the whole genre. They had to go from zero and build a culture. Every time I saw a bumper sticker, I would think to myself, one of us. If you told me in 2022 that that bumper sticker would be this iconic. It, it proved the point that we had listeners all over the place. Everyone was watching what was happening in our backyard. We were the authority. But it also made us the underdog story. They were one of the most influential stations in America. There's a movie in this place, there really is. This little house changed so many people's lives. I was the program director, and I started it. It's really weird. It's like there's a Robbie Robertson song from a solo album he did 30 years ago, and it said, and the line says, stirring up some ghosts. And this is definitely, even though it doesn't look anything like it because it's down to the studs, I mean, I haven't been here in 30 years. I was a uh, business major and a marketing major. And so my marketing professor said, take a business. One of our projects was to find a business and disassemble it, reassemble it, rebrand it, remark it, and, and tell me what you come up with. And I mean, the station was just a waste. So I was like, all right, let me take the station and, and boil it down and then see what I could do about rebuilding it and rebranding it. Yeah. And I bring it to Faye, because I mean, that was always my mindset that, okay, I was gonna do this for, the, for my degree, but the degree really didn't matter to me as much as getting her to put me in charge of the radio station. And I talked to the guys at Mom's Mall, and I got permission to do surveys there for three days. We talked, ended up talking to like, I forget now whether it was 15 or 1800 people. And on the surveys that I was asking people, it was very focused on certain demographic and asking them what they wanted to hear on radio, what they didn't get, what they weren't hearing on radio that they wanted to. Growing up around here, uh, you know, all we had were the New York stations, and most of them were what we now call classic rock. So it was just, you know, N.E.W. and P.L.J. And to me, that basically meant um, 
like the burnouts of the bus stop listening to Led Zeppelin. Like that's that's what that kind of music was. And that wasn't me. <laughs> In terms of like, you know, uh, speaking to me, big city radio was the sound of the past. It was already classic rock and it was already over. The bands had less control over their records. The bands had less control over the music. The DJs had less control over what they were playing. And everything became more and more corporate oriented. That's why radio started to suck for us. You could feel it. You could feel the the air come out of the room. Here, you play this and you play this and you say this. Now. The rock format as it existed, like an AOR format, album-oriented rock, was getting kind of stale. And all this other great new music was was coming out of the woodwork. I was really into all the stiff records and the stuff of the late 70s and then into the early 80s. So that was the kind of stuff I wanted to hear and no radio station was doing that. And so when I got all this information back, I turned it into like this huge document that was about like yay thick and gave it to my, my professor and he gave me a 4-0 for the class and I gave it to the owner of the radio station and she made me the program director. And so then I got to do that format. And uh, so we had those two turntables here, but then when we ch really changed it over to be a real rock station, they moved over, got new turntables and moved over there, used some old techniques. And then that's the window where I broke my finger live on the air one time when it slammed on me by mistake. <laughs> Mouthful. Speaking of mouthfuls, Rich Robinson is here with me. Hey, Mikey. Rich, and Rich is a mouthful. Good, though, you care. I brought Mike in. You know, we, we had known each other since, like, for the five years, six years prior to that. And we had the same taste in music. And so I knew I wanted his musical expertise in there, too. And But again, in, all, in order to augment the sound of the radio station, to get the records, we had to bring in our own albums all the time. And Mike had the biggest record collection of anybody I'd ever seen. We had to ship my record collection home from from Texas, Yellow Freight. And the guy pulls up in front of our house and goes, where's the store? He said, no, 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 that's my private collection. Everybody I, I brought in were, for the most part, never been in a radio station in their lives. People like Jimmy Swede became known as the dude, and Marone was just, you know, out of his mind. He was so fun, and Bart was a genius on the radio. I mean, all these people, Loretta was amazing, everybody. Lister, the whole crew, was just insanely talented. And I was really lucky to find them. Music was more important. You could work with the guy or girl. We wanted to make sure that if we were playing something or, or talking about it, that we knew what the hell we were saying. I wanted them to be very conversational. I wanted them to be themselves. I didn't want them to be, you know, Mr. Radio DJ. None of us put phony voices on. None of us used an assumed name. It's the hardest thing to do on the radio is be yourself and just to play the music and to do the segues and to be really involved in the music and be passionate about what they were playing. We never did shifts, we only did shows. Factory workers do shifts. I was dependent on those DJs teaching me what was new and what was cool. And I was 100% okay with being dependent on that. <laughs> They would talk about the records, but they'd give a little bit more insight into the records. And it was, before there was Wikipedia, there was Matt Pinfield, there was Mike Marone. There was, it, they just knew what they were talking about. And we liked each other. We genuinely liked each other. I mean, we hung out at my house all the time and had parties all the time. It was what it seemed to be. Everybody hung out, everybody went to shows together, they played softball together, they covered for each other, they took care of each other. We exuded that when we were out and about, and I, I would like to think that our listeners caught that, and that's why they felt so included, because they were included. The esprit de corps that they had um, among themselves um, really came across. So yeah, I mean, you, you felt like they were your friends, um, and you felt like you could learn from them and relate to them. They were great. The whole staff was fantastic. And then finally, enough people were they were saying, wow, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing over there? And they loved it. And that's why that station uh, blew up. It was almost like kismet. 
happening, you know, and, and the way that it all kind of fell together and getting the right people in at the right time and they all had the same mindset and the same love of music and, you know, Marone would bring his albums and Loretta brought hers and Chopper would have a DJ gig and he'd pull his records out so all of a sudden you couldn't find that one album that you, you'd been playing off of for the last six months because he had his albums with him at a gig. We're not going to do the new release show tonight because Mike packed up all the new releases and took them, took them along with him. But uh, we got plenty of uh, great rock and roll for you nonetheless. Mike and Rich worked very hard at cultivating relationships with people in the industry, namely with record people. You know, meeting Rich and Mike and these guys were just complete music junkies. I mean, they, you, you couldn't uh, have asked for, you know, two guys. Um, who loved music more and, you know, just looking to discover new music. You know, they wanted to break things. They wanted to be first. And um, and they loved a lot of the eclectic music that we had on Island Records. And they lived in our area. They were like our, our guys going out, promoting us to all the industry to say, like, these guys really know what they're doing. You should, you should listen into them. They were one of our priority stations and we wanted to make sure that they had the, you know, the big records uh, in a timely manner because they played all the, the little records for us. Like for example, the world premiere of a Simple Mind song, Don't You Forget About Me. And um, I think Bob gave us the world premiere of Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love and also a U2 song and there were some other ones too. They sent us a lot of great music and we got a lot of good interviews and it was just exploding. The phones never stopped ringing. We were getting like thousands of requests a week. It just seemed like it was clicking. It was it was getting into place. Uh, like we, we would do a softball game and the stands would be with lots of people there to see us play softball just for the hell of it. People would just feel free to come up to you and, and hand you their tape or CD and then, you know, ask you to play it. We didn't do a local music show when I was there because I didn't believe in it. If it was good enough to play it, went in a list. You know, went in a regular rotation. In the beginning, you could go there with a cassette, and they would take the cassette and transfer it to a cart, a cartridge, and they would play your cartridge on the radio because you didn't have a CD or you didn't have any other vehicle. You just made it on a cassette. It's not even mixed, right? I have this new, you know, new demo. Wondered if you listened to it or whatever. They played it. They played it, and Rich Robinson gave my daughter a little WHTG football. You know, we would get behind artists that didn't even have, you know, record deals and you know, and play them in regular rotation. So the perception was that they were big, important artists, but they were to us, and uh, we were trying to help people get a leg up. WHDG, you know, made us into a, if not local, a regional act. When you first hear your song on the radio, it's amazing. You feel like you made it in some degree. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a rung on the ladder that you've stepped up. You know, to be an unsigned artist and to have people appreciate what you're doing um, and to say that it was worthy of being on the air, it was, it's priceless. Their support, again, of our community and, and everything we did made it possible for us to get out of here, to get signed, to, to get on the radio. We were in California and we heard that HTG was playing our record and uh, we were thrilled to be on the radio in New Jersey because uh, the tri-state area, at least New York radio, was, was just not ever gonna play our music. There's two kinds of music, two. Stuff you like and stuff you don't. Made me feel as a teenager, okay, this is, this is it. This is, this is my generation's music. This is, this is, uh, this is cool, <laughs> and this is, uh, this is what I want to listen to, and it's, it's, it's made by us for us. So it's like that validation that you matter, you know, and you're part of the music community of this area, and plus then you're going to the clubs where these DJs are spinning on the weekends, and you're making friends with them. My father was an investor in a couple of bars through a convoluted set of circumstances. He ended up being the sole owner of the Green Parrot in Neptune. 
my father was kind of desperate and he came to me and asked me if uh, I could help. I mean, it was a meat market disco place, so I really didn't want to get involved unless I was allowed to change everything. I approached the DJs at WHTG, I went to Mike Marone and I said, look, this is what I'm thinking. And he was like, look, we're not just doing a WHTG night. You know, that, that, that won't work. I said, that's not what I'm interested in. I want the whole format for the whole club every night. People were looking for a place to go. That gave us a, an actual base of operations to bring in bigger bands, because the Pony wouldn't work with us. None of the other clubs would work with us, but Loretto was the first one to DJ there out of us. Okay. And then I went over there too. The way that they set it up there, where they had the, the HTG DJs, who were celebrities in their own right, regionally, pumping the heck out of these shows. It was like headquarters, you know, you could, you'd listen to the radio station, but then you would go see the bands at the Green Parrot, or you'd go hang out at the Green Parrot, so they kind of worked hand in glove. They were able to bring in so many of the bands that we played, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Soundgarden, and you know, the, the Laundry the Living Color and uh, Concrete Blonde and all these great bands that would come and play, and play for basically nothing. It was totally amazing. Like Lenny Kravitz, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I saw at the Green Parrot. Like, what the heck? Faith No More, that was another band I had the record. You know, we care a lot. Don't, 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 don't. Everybody has a story like that about a, a band that they saw that, that they might have seen elsewhere, but for some reason was just so much better <laughs> at the Green Parrot. I had guys camp out in the parking lot in vans that were on tour just in hopes that they could play that, that night. If you never went to the Green Parrot, it's about the size of this room, you know? And so it's like, it, was, it was very loud and, and a lot of fun. The place was mobbed. It was a crazy scene and it was very energizing uh, and that's where we found our audience. It's the coolest thing. You think that they're stars and you're opening for them. So then that makes you kind of elevated, right? You know, bands like Drama Rama, you know, before they hit. You know, and, and people are like, holy shit, this is a great band. How come I've never heard of them? And WHTG was playing our record and they were promoting the, the show and and it was it was packed. It was huge and it was it was it was wonderful. Uh, it was not unusual for record executives to come to the Green Parrot. They hated it. It was so far from the city. But they came, so it must have been important. Uh, uh, you know, you see uh, Ian Copeland show up in his stretch limousine, <laughs> which there was no place to park a stretch limousine, so the driver would have to go somewhere else. We're not in, we're not Nashville, you know. We're not uh, you know New York City, or you know what I'm saying. It was way more real. This idea that you had a community of people drawn together through music, outsiders for sure. Um, but feeling like they're part of something bigger, like they're part of something inclusive. I mean, I was at the Green Parrot, like, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There was nowhere else that I wanted to be because that's where all the cool things were happening, where the cool people were, and they were my friends. Without HTD, there was, there was never gonna be a Green Parrot. It, was it would be impossible without a radio station playing these bands. This is a brand new experience for me because no one was allowed to pass through this doorway. That was, you couldn't, you could never do that. I worked here for how many years and I was never able to walk through. The owner, Harold and Theo Gade, that was her name. So that's where the HTG came from. Well, Faye, the daughter, was actually running the station because Harold took off with his new wife to Hawaii. That was one of the real tense moments of our, of our time there when he lived out in Hawaii and got wind of what we had done to his radio station and he was just absolutely 100% against it. And so he tried to sell it from underneath her without her knowing about it and she caught wind of it and bought it. 
was able to come up with the money and buy the radio station from her father or else the place would have gone away. And that was like right as we were starting to hit our stride. Let's remember, she lived in the house we were working in every day and night. On this side, there's this one door. Behind the door was Faye's office. Behind another door, Faye's bedroom. You had to go through Faye Gates' kitchen to get to the stairs so that you could go down the stairs into what was the sales office. And the production studio. Not big, nothing fancy, but yes, all of this self-contained in one person's house. She was like a shut-in. She wasn't that much older than us, but she looked older. She always had these like these same dresses on and she had the glasses on and you know, she would always she would come in while you were on and she'd want to talk. Faye being up in the middle of the night when I was working the overnights and coming in at three in the morning and saying, Hi, how are you? Like <gasps> <laughs> one of the guys and shed cats and the cats would run throughout the radio station. That, that was her thing, you know, she didn't have kids, so she had her two cats. And so it was Rusty and Buddy while I was there, and then there was a third cat. There was a third, and they were all orange. Cats were everywhere. Cats were very challenging in the parking lot at times. They were a little aggressive. Throwing on a record, running outside, going, where'd the cat go? Where's the cat? How did it get out? <laughs> I think it was Rusty in the studio, and he, he comes in and everything, and I'm playing a record. I'm like, oh God, oh God, please don't jump up there. <laughs> Shoo, shoo. There was all these different rules, like make sure the wet and yucky garbage is separate from the paper garbage. The problem was, honestly, I mean, you know, that they did, Faye and, and the guy's name Dick Sweditz, who was the GM um, and, the, and the chief engineer, I mean, they allowed us to do this. So that's one thing. But they weren't really supportive. Dick always said that radio was a lot better when there weren't DJs there. And so he didn't have a lot of, um, of love for us. He put a lot of pressure on Rich Robinson and the DJs, and he was always kind of undermining them the whole time. Well, I mean, like we all used to joke about the budget or lack thereof. It was a source of sometimes amusement, sometimes annoyance. So when I finally convinced him we had to play this new REM album, it was our format, he had to get us a CD player. He got us two of the cheapest CD players I've ever seen in my life. And they would break constantly. They were like Radio Shack CD players. But they would, you know, you could play the CD, but you had to like, that was one of the ones where you had to like put something underneath the tray to keep the tray in, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was just, it was horrible. We only had one extra mic. There was the mic for the DJ, and then there was a mic over here that we could set up for the interviewee or interviewees. So Matt was on the air, there was a band waiting there, and we waited outside, and somebody came outside and said, hey, listen, we ran out of soda. Can you guys do us a big favor and drive to the store and get us a case of soda? You'd get shocked by putting your, if you touched, there were loose wires underneath, on, you know, that you would touch and get shocked. The fact that the AP news wire was in a closet, it was in the coat closet. <laughs> I was making $5 an hour at HTG. I was the music director, assistant program director, and, and full-time DJ. I was making five dollars an hour. There's only so long, you know, I mean. <laughs> and I mean, I used to have to like fudge hours for people, like pad their time checks, their time things, you know, so they'd get more money so they wouldn't leave, you know, because I would have to do payroll every week with the owner. And I'd say, oh yeah, they did all this. They, I'd tack on another five or 10 hours that they never really did just so they can make some more money so they wouldn't be looking elsewhere for another job. I don't think any of us could afford not to have two or three jobs. I mean, that's what we did, you know? And we worked our asses off. I mean, literally 80 hours a week for a year, seven days a week building that. One time Faye said thanks to me. One time when we did pretty well in the ratings, one time. She said, congratulations. I don't think she said thanks to her. Congratulations. So I left at the end of 88. At that time, there was starting to be an influx of people that were not there for the same reasons I was. When they got rid of Rich, they brought in this other uh, program director, um, Mike Butcher. I knew Mike. Mike and I talked, and, I, and he goes, you know, I, I told them everything about the station. And I, he goes, well, you know, I got I to gotta hire a music director. I said, you got the best music director in the country on your staff right now. And he goes, who? I said, Matt Pinfield. 
when they made the changes, when Rich and uh, who was program director and Chopper uh, departed, um, Michael Butcher came in from uh, Washington, D.C. and he had decided that I would be his music director. That really changed everything, you know, because then I was in touch with all the label people, um, you know, because the music was being filtered through myself to Michael Butcher and, and the rest of the staff. He was the kind of guy that would call when you're on the air on a Saturday and he'd go, you know, it's April, it's a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. And I was just thinking of that Jesus and Mary chain song, April Skies, throw that on Michelle. You know, we weren't trying to be like these uh, egoed out, jaded gatekeepers. We um, had a genuine love for music and wanted to help out artists uh, get from one step to the other. And um, continuing on with what Mike and Rich had started there. If there was a label guy that was like bringing somebody through town, you know, Matt might make a call for you and be like, hey, you should have these guys on the bill. They're great, they're blowing up. I'm playing them, you know, 20 times a week and I'm getting calls on them. Like, who's doing that? He knows your name, he never forgets it. He never forgets anything about a band. He remembers release dates, he remembers concert dates, he remembers set lists. He's an amazing musical genius, and he is a kingmaker, and charming, and um, fun to be with, and just, he's music personified, he's rock and roll. You know, I won Music Director of the Year uh, in 91 and 92. Um, I was absolutely dumbfounded and, and shocked that um, I was voted on by my peers and by the labels. But when the Nirvana explosion took place, and everything happened in 91, and, alternative became mainstream and a ton of other radio stations started signing on playing this music it was a seismic shift i think it proved anything it proved how right we were that there was this a, a completely underground and great music that people had you know that a lot of the mainstream ignored up to that time or thought was so fringe and didn't realize how important these artists were and how great they were Matt Pinfield was the music director when I left, which was February of 1992. And he has a great ear for music. Um, so thankfully he kept the music focused on being as alternative as possible. But, but the world of alternative radio was changing and there were a lot more stations doing it. Well, it became a little bit more formatted, but I mean, you can't, you can't fault them for wanting to try and get ratings. Those guys, you know, like I was still in the area until I left for New Mexico. So I would keep, you know, keep up to speed on what they were doing. But you're right, I mean, other radio stations were also, you know, they, we, you know, 106.3 wasn't the only station playing Nirvana anymore. For, for a brief shining moment in the early to mid 90s when everybody's eyes turned towards Gen X and said, we should make money off these people while they're still young and spending, then those radio stations started picking, picking up on it. Maybe the station is no longer as underground as we think when all of a sudden you could look at New York and go, wait a minute, Z100's playing this? What? Well, when New York starts, you know, copying your format, y you know? They became an influencer and then what happened was everybody else got on the bandwagon and it was less unique. And I, you know, I never, I had no idea where my life was going to go, you know, I, the MTV thing wasn't even, a th you know, I didn't, Ever think I was going to end up doing national television and being able to talk about music in the same passionate way I was doing it on HCG. You know what it felt like when Matt went to MTV? It's like Matt was like, it's like it was all Technicolor. Then he goes to MTV, it was like it got very, it felt quiet. And so you had new staff members coming in, maybe with different ideas, different ideas about music. I got offered the job back at HTG to be the PD again, and there was a whole new crew there. And they were really, really good. Glenn Vistica, Mike Salter, Michelle Amabile, who's still doing radio at 107, and a bunch of other people. And we kind of got that back again, because we were all really good friends. Even up until the time the station was, you know, no longer in the house, and when it was sold and went to G1063, I mean, there was still great programming on it when I could hear it. When I found out about the station being sold, I was in shock. 
and I say this with all due respect to Press Communications, I think they had their heart in the right place trying to do what they were going to do. I don't know if they were fully prepared to really go there. Once it stopped being HCG and it became like that kind of, I forget what they called it, like G1063 or something like wow. that. <laughs> and then, uh, then yeah, it was, it was totally different. But by then, the whole culture had been co-opted anyway. Once you break that trust, it's over. It trends, it becomes a thing, people want it. Too many people get it, it becomes commercial, it's not cool anymore, and then younger kids come up with something else that trends. And it is human nature time and time again. The playlist changed. Um, it went towards a more harder rock, active rock um, format, which, which followed like in the wake of grunge. That was a passionate time with the listeners. They protested out in the parking lot. The people that have the love and the passion, they have to instill that in everyone around them so people can understand what they're doing there in the first place. However, most of the time, it never ends up being what it was at the beginning. And that's why you have people that say, oh, that's when it ended, that's when it went away, that's when it turned into this. It was different. You know, I knew that because I was, you know, dealing with corporate and dealing with a lot of moving parts, but I realized six months in the job, this is way different than I thought it was gonna be. I had this meeting in a hotel room and they're like, so, so why do you play Dramarama? And like these guys have been the number one requested band. Anytime, anytime they put anything out, it was number one on our playlist all the time. They would sell out every show. They were huge and they wouldn't buy it. And that's when I realized that things aren't gonna last a long time. And I think they, yeah, I think they even started playing a little bit more, I don't wanna say mainstream, but you know, like the, the music was a little bit more crossover kind of, and yeah. it's getting a little blurred, the lines there, yeah. It opened that door toward, you know, to to more of like the Woodstock 99 fiasco, um, you know, which is like, you know, the hard rock, the rap rock, uh, 311 was played a lot, I remember that. This is all stuff that people speculate about. And the bottom line is, listen, people are part of a music industry because of the second word, the industry. And so the station didn't last in the format much longer after that. And then that was it. It's amazing when I think about the impact that the station had because it was like, you know, it's almost like the little station that could because when you think about it, it's like this little ranch house in the middle of nine acres of land in the middle of Tinton Falls, New Jersey. That, you know, and it's always really heartwarming to know that, you know, that people, that it had that kind of effect on people. It, cha it did, it changed, it got people to, you know, to become musicians or do, you know, or to follow up on, on whatever their passion was. It gave them the freedom, I think, to know that, you know, you're, you're not weird if you like something different than other people. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good legacy to have. Yeah, I think it could happen again, but I don't know that I'll live to see it. Let me put it that way. Can it? Yes. Will it? Unlikely. It, it happens cyclically, and I think it's happened many times in history. Whether it'll happen again here, I don't know, but you, you can't manufacture it. It just happens. I hope somebody does it. I really do. I want to I see maybe another revolution come up. You're not going to get a bunch of freaks like us to work for no money and build this thing. I don't know how we got lucky, <laughs> but we did, and I'm really glad that, that it was there. You can't credit it to timing. You still had to do what Rich Robertson and Mike Marone and Loretta Windis and Chopper, what they all did. You know, you could never have that kind of freedom to put together a station that would be so in the moment and so locally, you know, pertinent to the people that are in that market. HCG provided, like, a, a, you know, it's an incredible breath of fresh air to radio in general, and that's why the station was so important and I think really changed a lot of lives, including those of us who worked there. If MTV was the record store, like HTG was like the back room with all the cool kids with the secret music. They were a funnel system for everything that we wore, you know, like a whole new set of clothes every couple of years. Like when I think of it, it just brings back a flood of memories, good, positive, 
teenage memories. If given a chance to go back, I would, I, I would still do it. I would do it every time. Something that I'm, I'm really grateful for to have experienced and be a part of. People are still coming up to me today and saying how much the station meant to them, means to them. I don't know that I would be a music journalist were it not for a station like WHTG. The HTG changed my life entirely. I met friends that way. I met my husband that way. Without it, it never would have been the same. I'd be very surprised if a radio station ever had the kind of influence on a community that WHTG did. It was just a unique time, and it was so much fun. And it was all coming out of this little house on Hope Road. Four months shy of my 10-year anniversary on these airwaves at a station the likes of which never was before and will likely never be again. WHTG FM Eatontown, owned and operated by WHTG Incorporated, now leaves the airwaves. <laughs>